What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new to the channel, my name is Humphrey Yang and I make videos here on personal finance and entrepreneurship on YouTube. Today's video is all about beginner investing mistakes and I've compiled six that I come across the most often. With the stock market at close to its all time high right now, there's a lot of general interest in investing in general. I often get DMs from viewers just like you asking if they should buy in now, if they should invest at all, and there's just general uncertainty about the market in general. I can almost guarantee that the viewers watching this right now have been guilty of or are currently guilty of one of these six investing mistakes. By sticking with me to the end of this video, I'm hoping that you're able to avoid these mistakes entirely and just save yourself a bunch of money in the process. Now guys, I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes in life. I mean, just look at this picture of me from a long time ago. I've got this weird haircut. Is what, what is that? Is that like a bowl cut? I'm not even too sure. But like most mistakes, you typically learn from your mistakes. Like for example, I no longer have that haircut and with investing mistakes, I'm hoping that you're able to learn from my experiences and this video in itself, just to make sure that you don't make any mistakes going forward. So the first mistake that can be avoided when it comes to investing is paying too much in fees. One of the traditional thoughts when it comes to investing is to simply just park your money with a financial advisor who will just invest it in mutual funds for you. Mutual funds are essentially a portfolio of stocks and bonds that are professionally managed. As a result of having professional management or active management, as they say, as a result, their expense ratios or fees are rather high. To give you an idea on how much in fees they could actually charge you, according to Morningstar, the average large cap fund with assets greater than $5 million has an expense ratio of 1.45%. Now compare that to a Vanguard index fund like VTSAX, which tracks the S&P 500, and the expense ratio on that is 0.04%. VT Sachs, as it's known, offers you the ability to buy that fund and all of a sudden get a small piece of everything that it owns in the fund itself. It's also passively managed and also has a lot of diversification built in because it's investing in the total stock market. But what's the impact of having a 0.04% expense ratio versus a 1.4 or 1.45% expense ratio? Let me show you right now. In this example, comparing VTSAX to a large cap mutual fund such as the Rydex NASDAQ 100 fund, if you were to invest $10,000 for 20 years and the fund returns remained the same, it would result in a net difference of $11,000 just in fees. How crazy is that? So the number one rule that I have for you guys when you're starting to invest, and the moral of the story here is, is that whenever you're looking at something to invest in, especially if it's a mutual fund or an index fund, always pay attention to the expense ratio and make sure that it's as low as it possibly can be. If you would like more info on mutual funds versus index funds versus ETFs and what the differences are, I have a video that I made on YouTube that I'll link like right up here that you can click on and watch after this video. Now, the second mistake that I see a lot of beginner investors make is trying to time the market. I know it's a bit anxiety feeling when you're trying to figure out if you should enter the market or not, but honestly, the best time to enter the market is immediately. Everybody wants to get into the market when it's at its low point, but really, we don't really know when the low point is until after it has passed. It's really tempting to pick the market highs and the market lows so that your portfolio never goes down in value, but truly, that's not really realistic. So I'm super guilty of this, and I'm sure everyone watching has been super guilty of this too. You see the market at an all-time high, and you're like, man, should I really invest right now? So you get a little bit too nervous, and what you wanna do is you just wanna wait for a dip in the market, and you're like, okay, that's when I'm gonna buy. The problem with that is, is that the 99% of people that are just gonna wait to time the market, what they end up doing is just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then all of a sudden the market keeps climbing, 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 they get impatient, then they buy in. When in reality, if they had just bought in earlier, they just would have been way better off. So then what happens is, is that these same people eventually just buy at the very, very top of the market. They get really panicked when it goes down just a little bit. And what do they do? They buy high and they sell low, which is never what you should do, but Really, the whole buy low, sell high thing is really stupid too. Just buy immediately because being in the market beats timing the market. The best strategy, I believe, is just to buy long-term investments and hold them for a very long time and just save yourself the headache. In a Charles Schwab research report, they studied five different hypothetical trading strategies for someone who was given $2,000 a year to invest. And the results are really crazy. Let me show you. The five investing strategies were as such, the best person was always able to time the market perfectly, so they always bought with their $2,000 at the low. The next person just took whatever $2,000 they got, immediately invested it into the market. The third person dollar cost averaged into the market over a period of 12 months. The fourth person invested at the worst possible time every single year, that's known as bad timing, but they always bought at the high. 
And lastly, the last strategy was just sitting all in cash. So which one do you think did the best? Not surprisingly, perfect timing did the best over a period of 20 years, but the thing is, is that you're not gonna be perfect 20 years in a row. The next best strategy was actually just to invest immediately. In fact, it actually did a little bit better than dollar cost averaging. The point I'm trying to make is this, investing immediately into the market is always gonna be better than trying to time the market. For 99.99% of you investors out there, this is gonna be the case, so I would recommend just trying to not time the market entirely. So the third mistake I see beginners making is just simply not investing at all. If you noticed in the last picture that I showed you, cash was the worst performing strategy of all five. The thing is that many people are scared to invest because they're kind of uncertain about investing and they don't wanna lose what they already have. While there are ups and downs in the market and in the short term, you could lose money. The problem is, is if you don't invest at all, you're still gonna be losing to what's called inflation. The inflation target set by the Fed is about 2% per year. In my lifetime alone, the purchasing power of the dollar has gone down quite a bit. And this might hold true for where you live as well. I mean, think about the prices in your local area. For example, I used to drink smoothies in middle school at Jamba Juice when Jamba Juice first came on the scene in North America, and at the time, a 24-ounce smoothie was only $3.25. Nowadays, I don't think you can get a 24-ounce smoothie from Jamba Juice for anything less than $7 in California. So that's just in 20 years, but that gives you an example of how purchasing power has gone down. I'm sure you guys have noticed this in your hometowns too. Maybe the price of just buying lunch out or buying dinner has just increased significantly over the past 10 years, and you're just like, man, why is everything so expensive all of a sudden? So if you leave your money in the bank now, you're actually just gonna be losing out to inflation. So what can you do to combat that? At least put your money into something that is returning at least 2% a year or somewhat beating inflation because that will help you out in the long term. The fourth mistake that I see beginners making is not considering tax implications. Something that a lot of new beginner investors don't know is that stocks are actually subject to taxation. Taxation depends on the stock, how much you've earned on the stock and how long you've actually held it for. You'll pay income taxes on any dividends or interest payments and capital gains taxes on the actual share price of the stock itself that you hold and if it goes up. If you hold investments like stocks for the long term, such as longer than a year, you actually qualify for what's called long-term capital gains rates and those rates are slightly less than short-term capital gains rates. So if you are investing, make sure to invest for the long term because that'll save you some money in taxes. But if you wanna avoid taxes altogether, what you can do is open up a tax-free retirement account. Since taxes will take a huge chunk out of your investments throughout your lifetime, the best thing to do is open something like a Roth IRA. Now, please note that a Roth IRA is a retirement account, so if you are going to invest in a Roth IRA, that it's for the long term because likely you are going to be withdrawing this when you retire. There are penalties for withdrawing your money from Roth IRAs early, and I detail all of those things in my Roth IRA video, which I will link to right here above so that you can check that out. But if you're looking for the best place to actually open up a Roth IRA, I would just suggest a really big brokerage firm like Vanguard or Fidelity or Charles Schwab. A lot of people will try to get into investing with a quick, easy brokerage like Robinhood, TD Ameritrade, or something like E-Trade. But the thing is, is that if you don't have your Roth IRA already set up with some investments for the long term, I would actually shy away from those just to start because of the tax implications that they may carry. So it's important to remember whenever you're investing in something to always look at the tax implications. The fifth mistake I see investors making is that they typically let other people influence their investment decisions. Chances are, if you get into investing, everyone and their mother is gonna have some sort of investment opinion for you. They'll have a certain tip or some sort of investment strategy that they follow that you know is guaranteed to double your money in the next six months. The problem is that everyone's investing strategies is gonna be different and different for the person that it applies to. What works for them isn't gonna work for you and vice versa. This is because we all have different risk tolerances, different goals, and different investing strategies that we wanna follow. So while it may turn out that others are making more than you in any certain given period, it's important to not let them affect you too much and play into whatever their strategy is. As you get more invested into the market emotionally, <laughs> do you see what I did there, invested into the market? People are gonna always come up to you with like different options plays, different speculative plays, but you know, if you just stick to your own strategy, that's gonna be best for you. I would say the majority of bad investing advice actually comes from people who just wanna get rich quickly. If you can avoid the pitfall of trying to get rich quickly and instead just try to get rich slowly, you're gonna do a lot better for yourself. And all that takes is consistently investing over a long period of time. Now, the sixth mistake that I see beginners making a lot is kind of a two-parter. It's one, not knowing how much to invest and two, not knowing what goals to invest for. What you wanna do when you first start investing is figure out a goal that you wanna do with your investing. 
That way you can kind of reverse engineer an investing strategy that works for you and that can get you to your goal. For example, if your goal is to retire early and live off of passive income, try to figure out how much passive income do I need per year. If your lifestyle costs 50K a year and you wanna generate that with investments alone, then at a 5% return, you're gonna need a nest egg or basically an investment pool of about a million dollars. So if your goal is to make a million dollars by the time you're 45 and you're the age of 20 now, that gives you 25 years to get to a million dollars of liquid cash invested. If you look at a compound interest calculator, you can actually achieve this by investing 15K a year from the ages of 20 to 45 and achieving a 7% rate of return in the market with compound interest, you'll actually be well over a million dollars in liquid cash by the time you're 45. So in terms of where you can get 7% return, well, the S&P 500 historically over the past 50 years has returned close to 8%. So simply just by investing in index funds that are invested in the stock market, you could feasibly, reasonably get 8% on your money. So my point is this, by having a goal in mind, you kind of already figure out how much you need to invest, how often you need to invest, and what rate of return you actually need to achieve. Another example might be maybe your goal is just capital preservation. You just don't want to lose your money, but you also don't want to lose out to inflation. So what kind of investing strategy will net you 2 3% a year without you know risking your money too much? Similarly, if you want to be liquid in cash because you want to make a big purchase in the next one or two years, like a house, maybe that's right for you as well. And that's going to influence your investing decisions and also how much you invest. So I think a lot of beginners can just benefit from asking themselves the question, what is it that I want to get out of investing and just simply work backwards from there. Anyways, guys, I hope that you learned something from this video and learned from some of the mistakes that common beginners make. I personally am guilty of almost all of them. So uh, if you are too, let me know in the comments below. If you've made it this far already, make sure to like the video for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe to my channel because I make two videos a week here on YouTube on personal finance, and also click that notification bell to get notified whenever I drop a video. Also, make sure to follow me on Instagram. I post there pretty much all the time. So if you'd like to be a part of it there, that's where you can find me. And lastly, if you do want a free stock from Robinhood, I do have a link in my description below. So if you use that link, you'll be able to get that free stock. Thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you guys in the comment section and I'll see you guys in my next video. Okay, peace.